The Chronicle on Higher Education asked me um, when we finished our campaign two years ago, which at the time was the uh, most successful campaign that had been run in higher education and completed. I, I don't know if it still is or not, but uh, uh, we, we had raised uh, for six years um, current value, a uh, million dollars a day, seven days a week for 365 days a year. The last year we raised $2 million a day for the year. Uh, so our original goal had been 2.5 billion, we ended up with 3.1 billion. So it caught people's attention. And the Chronicle asked me, um, how, uh, how much time a week do you spend on fundraising? And I said about two hours. And the woman didn't believe me. And she said, what do you mean two hours? And I said, well, it's those two hours when I meet with my sidekick, okay, a woman that uh, Naomi helped train, a woman that's been uh, at my side now for, um, let's see, between the law school and this assignment, I've been at this kind of thing for 24 years, and I guess I hired her in my second year. So she's been with me for 23 years as my chief fundraising person. She had never done any fundraising before I, the day I hired her. She was a lawyer with a, um, a um, she was running a small business, and she had just moved from Cleveland to New York, and a, a mutual friend introduced us. So there's something there, because as you know from Naomi's autobiography, she had never done any fundraising before she came to NYU either as the chief fundraiser. But anyway, um, about two hours a week I spend with Deborah, and we, we essentially do the strategic conversation. Who's meeting with whom? Who am I meeting with? Uh, where are we? Where are we going? It's the conversation about deploying the troops. And we'll go over the appointments that I have, and I, I try to have uh, you know, our rule of thumb has been four or five appointments a week that she makes, and in 24 years, the rule has been, and we've lived with it so far, never cancel an appointment. Sometimes the other person reschedules, but never cancel an appointment. And, and, and even when you get up in the morning, and there are those, because some days there are three or four appointments, and, and you look at the schedule and it just feels arduous, you do it. And usually the other side of it, you feel pretty good about having done it. But you never cancel an appointment. And um, you go into those appointments then, and the woman from the Chronicle said, doesn't that count? Doesn't that count as fundraising? And I said, well, no. Because uh, I find at least that if, if you're meeting with a person who has the capacity to give you a substantial gift, that that, that person is, um, if you put yourself in, and this comes from being a Catholic and having lived through the Vatican Council, and, and having learned that, uh, that life is lived much better if you don't insist on looking at it through the window you were originally given. But if you could move around the diamond and look at it through the many facets of a diamond. So instinctively, if, you're, if your mindset is what Pope John XXIII called ecumenical, uh, if, if, that's your, if that's your mindset, you're instinctively viewing the conversation through the other person's eyes. And, and it, 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 or to put it another way, it's a skill that Americans, and especially male Americans, don't have very, 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 very high in their skill set. It's the skill of really listening. It's the, it's the, and, 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 and constantly kind of retooling your view based on what you're hearing that you find meritor meritorious. Or if you find what the person says, and this is interesting, in a, in, a, in, in a lunch or a breakfast or a coffee or whatever it is that could be viewed as fundraising, 
right? Uh, 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 many people would think it's inappropriate to disagree with the potential donor, but I, I find that's very useful because I'm not approaching it principally as a fundraiser. I, I mean, I never forget to ask. And, and usually I do it in the first sentence, you know, usually as I sit down, just so, it's because one of the things Naomi pounded into me, and I was terrified not only of her, but of my capacity to raise money. And one of the things she said was, there are two key things in fundraising, never forget to ask, and never ask for too little. Okay, you never insult the person by asking them for too much. So I usually, as soon as I sit down, because I can just feel Naomi's presence behind me, I, 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 I usually say, look, you know, I just want to be clear about our agenda for today. And of course, you know that part of why I'm here is to, to ask you to give. And I, I don't use a specific amount. But I'll say, depending upon the particular context, to give hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars or, you know, I haven't yet used the B word, but you know, there'll come a time. And, it, when you, and you say, I, I, so of course I'm going to get to the point where I'm going to ask you. I, I mean, I'm in a conversation with a, 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 a person this morning where what I said was, where, where what I'm going to ask you to do is give more to NYU than you in your formidable philanthropic career have given in total to everybody else. So it, it, it gets a person's mind in a certain place. You know, but I, I, that's the first, as I'm, but, but before we do that, we have to get to know each other, or if you know, we have to talk a little more about the ideas, or I have to give you an update, and, and then we get into the other stuff, but at least I've gotten it out. I've broken the ice, as we used to say, in the streets of Brooklyn and basketball. I've broken the ice, and, 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 and it's easier to return to it at, at that point. But when you're in the conversation, if you're, if you're really, um, if, 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 if what you're really trying to do is answer that question, am I living a useful life? Presumptively, you're with a person that's really smart. Now, they may not be really smart in the way that um, professors are smart. They may be smart more in the way, you know, that I'm smart, you know, street smart. You know, Duncan is smart, smart. New York Review of Books, smart. I'm smart, smart. You know, rolling dice on the streets of Brooklyn, smart. It's a different kind of, but, but, and, and the people you're dealing with may be in different places on that. But believe me, the people like me know bullshit when they see it, right? And, 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 they, and they sense, you know, you know as, as, as the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi said in, in talking to me about why he made what could be viewed as the largest gift in, 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 in the history of higher education, if you view it a certain way, because, it, it, you know, I, I mean, annually, he, he gives the largest gift, in a way, by supporting our enterprise there. And he said to me, uh, about two or three years ago, I made this judgment the first time we met, because in a Bedouin community, you judge people through their eyes. And it's been fun finding out that people from Brooklyn do the same thing. So, you know, there's this judgment that's going on and you're in this conversation and you're listening, but you're constantly coming back to that question for yourself. Am I living a useful life? And, uh, and, 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 and this person is telling you, you know, that idea is not very good. And it's not a bad thing then if you think that the person's wrong to get in a conversation about it. Because one of you may change or modify the views of the other, and you may leave, and my, my experience over the years has been you leave with a much better view of the value proposition of NYU than you entered the conversation. So every one of those conversations is principally about that value proposition. It is not about fundraising. Fundraising is a kind of ancillary effect of it. 
And, and in a very real way, it goes back to uh, dreaming and storytelling. I mean, I, t I tell folks, you know, uh, what, what I'm good at, and it's important to know what you're good at when you're not, what I'm good at is noticing, and I, I sometimes can notice what people are doing before they notice it. Or I can draw a connection and see a place they can go. Call that a dream if you want. But it's what naturally evolves. Because, you know, in universities, we don't have command and control power over our core key people. You can't order faculty to do anything. Right? In, in fact, if you order them to do it, that's the greatest guarantee they won't do it. But you can tell them a story of what they're doing. And if they recognize it, this is, this is, this is what we, we learn by, by, this is my baseball as a road to God class. This is basic Marcia Eliad. This has been true for millennia. Mythos is, is, is the story of the community. And yes, it can be a dream. As Jay knows, my son says, dad experiences the world as 15% better than it is. And he tells the story of what he sees as 10% better than that. So Jed says, if you want to know the truth and you're listening to dad, you have to double discount. <laughs> so, you know, so he said that about 20 years ago and I kind of realize he's right. So I try to adjust, you know, and so there's this complex Bellman's equation going on of dynamic mathematics. I don't know what the right discount rate is, but you know what? My, 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 my other mentor, Norman Dawson at the law school used to say to me early on in my time as dean, he said, you know, you always exaggerate. I mean, you know, like I was magna, but he called me summa, but that's fine. You know, I probably was summa. I always said at the law school, they were much too concerned with facts and not enough with truth. <laughs> you know, and, I, and we, we, we look for truth, not facts. And my diploma does say magna, but it, was, it felt summa to me. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the Norman used to say, you're, you're always exaggerating. You, you always use the definite article when you should use the indefinite. You always use the superlative when you should use the comparative. And then after about four or five years, he, 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 he said, you know, he said, in the dean, that's not a bad characteristic. <laughs> because you always should be, should be calling the case. Now, you can't get so disconnected with your story from the reality on the ground that it's grounds for civil commitment. Because then people won't believe and they won't respond to it. But if the mythos, if they see themselves there, that's, that, that's the great calling. And that's the power of the dream. So uh, to bring all this together, and then I'll just give you one quick illustration, and uh, then I'll do whatever Naomi says. But I will have ended within my time. And if you want to ask questions, you can, I think. But um, to bring it together, uh, I think a fundraiser's life is a worthy life is a useful life. Uh, so long as you remember that that's where it starts. Because you know what? If you're not convinced of the worthiness of your life being lived for the institution you're serving, you're not going to be able to convince every, anybody who's sitting there across the table for you, smart as he or she is, in whatever way he or she is smart, in a world where, you know, I got news for you, you're not the only people with whom they're having lunch or coffee or breakfast. There are 20 other people coming in and are saying, and by the way, they've got heart-wrenching stories and worthy causes. So, so it's not enough for you simply to make them feel you're doing some good. You have to make sure you make them feel you are doing the good that they want to support among all of those options. Because if you're in their space, if you're hearing the conversation through their ears, not through your own, you have to understand that they're hearing those other 19 presentations as well. 
And, and it, it all comes back, it seems to me, in, in your, uh, you're having devoted your talent to this institution instead of to those other 19. And if you can't explain that, which you should be asking yourself regularly, then you're not gonna be able to explain it to them. Now, very quick illustration. And I'll use NYU for this. And I'll use 2001 for this. And I will oversimplify, but that's okay because I'll be passing the essence of the truth to you. <clears throat> so, this is New York City, if you haven't noticed. And when you walk out of this building, uh, you're gonna be looking at a park that's not ours. And uh, you're gonna step on sidewalk. You're not gonna go through a gate. The minute you walk out of the building, you're in the city. And although around the park, which we don't own, uh, there are mostly NYU buildings, most NYU buildings are not next to NYU buildings. You walk out of them and, and uh, you gotta walk a block before you see another NYU building. And, and since we don't put flags on all of our buildings, uh, you may not even know you're passing an NYU building. So this is a very strange way for a university to be. I mean, I was at the University of Michigan yesterday. Believe me, it looks different from this. Okay, and even, even universities you think of as urban, like University College London or GW in Washington or BU, I mean, places that kind of have the same structural anatomy as us, they have their quadrangles and their campuses and their gates. And think of the way Columbia is in the same city that we're in. They've got their space. And you know, it's, it's got their color on it and even their expansion, their six million square feet, it had to be uh, uh, contiguous and they had to have hegemony. They'll let normal citizens walk the streets, but you'd have to have an ID to get in the buildings and it, it, you'll know you're in Columbia space. Whereas we're much more ecosystematic with the city. And then 9-11 uh, happens. So this university, one of the great insights that Jay had and that Naomi had in her storytelling, one of the great uh, features of this city in which we are is, uh, now I'm gonna use a word that uh, begins to name the story, is its ecumenical quality. Not, not ecumenical in the sense that John XXIII used it, not in a religious ecumenism, but, but uh, ecumenical in the sense of the diamond rather than the window that I used before. Uh, a, kind of, a kind of embrace of uh, uh, moving through different ways at looking at the world and understanding. I mean, John XXIII didn't say to people like Jay and me, give up the faith, capital F, but understand the faith better by seeing the wisdom and beauty of other faiths and how they reflect upon you. So the man under whom I did my doctorate, it, 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 when I encountered him in 1963 for the first time, was an expert on St. Anselm, one medieval Christian theologian. 20 years later, he was at the United Nations being celebrated in a three-day conference for his 60-volume work on world spirituality, which featured 25 faith traditions. So that was the spirit of ecumenism that John XXIII preached. And if you think about it, New York City is the first ecumenical city in a secular sense. We're the first city that can say, in, in our public schools, every country in the world is represented by children born in that country. Uh, you can go to the neighborhoods of New York and you can hear the language of, of, of any nation. You can hear the prayers of any religion. You can taste the food of any culture. Uh, and and the, now as we enter the 21st century, the big issue is gonna be with the world shrinking, with the world miniaturizing, uh, can we live together? There's no more gating. We just found it out about, about the uh, uh, economy. Uh, Egypt 
found it out about ideas. You can't gate people out anymore. No matter how high we build the fence or make the, the lasers, we're not gonna gate people out. And uh, the question is, how do we deal with that? Do we, do we see it as fearful, as a clash of civilizations, which will create a kind of social nuclear explosion, or do we see it as a great ecumenical opportunity? A great ecumenical opportunity. And, and here, now I'm in a conversation with you over, t over coffee or lunch or breakfast. Here, we, this is the great question of our time. And New York City is the first experiment in a way in creating a city that's a community of communities where people identify themselves first as New Yorkers. Uh, the, 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 the mayor of Amsterdam was, was, uh, heard me talk about these themes and, and came for lunch and said, my city doesn't work that way. People identify themselves first as Turks or, 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 or whatever nationality they are. But New Yorkers think of themselves as New Yorkers, a community of communities. Is this experiment going to work? And then can we make it work on a world level? You know, with the flowing of, of talent pe talented people among idea capitals. And all of a sudden, you have a view of the role of a university. Because universities have always been on the ecumenical side of that question. And, uh, and even what flows out of it, and I'm not going to go into this, is uh, if you want, I write reflections to drive the story if you go on my website you'll see I've written now about a dozen what I call reflections. And they tend to be 40 pages, 50 pages. They're not research papers, but they're thought papers about a different part of the university. So out of this view of New York and of NYU as ecosystematic with New York comes a view of what's called the Global Network University, which ends up having campuses around the world and creating a flow of our students and faculty as a great ecumenical instrument. So it's a story. And it's a story that resonates. It, you know, we just recruited one of the great neuroscientists in the world from Stanford. Why? Because he was attracted to the story. We just recruited the most selective entering class, the most selective entering class in the world for NYU Abu Dhabi. You know, uh, we got a yield which was unprecedented, an 80% yield on our offers. Uh, on every measure, they were the most talented students in the world. They turned down Oxford and Baydar and Harvard to come to two high school buildings in downtown Abu Dhabi because we don't yet have, we don't yet have a, 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 a campus. It won't be built. They, I call them seniors. They're, they're all freshmen, but they're going to be seniors. Since we only have freshmen, I, I say you're going to be seniors for four years. But these courageous kids gave up the Ivy for the story. So uh, my point is, it was, it's the same story that then evokes philanthropy, whether it be from a crown prince or from a businessman. And, and it's, it, 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 it's compelling to some at a fundamental level. And coming back to John, it's, it's, it makes me feel I'm living a worthy life. And it makes me feel I'm using my talent well. And, you know, Richard and his wife Patsy were, are, uh, one of the few sets of couples friends of mine and Lisa's. And he knows that, that before Lisa's death, um, if you ask me, what are you going to do next? My answer was, I'm going to create a high school in Brooklyn for kids the system misses. But since Lisa's death, because that was about my life before Lisa, because her life was so much about ecumenism and, um, and interreligious and interracial dialogue, this makes me feel that I'm honoring her too. And that keeps me going and makes it a lot easier to be believable when you ask for that, whatever it is whether it's $5 or $5 billion. And if you believe, the chances are you'll be successful. 
So I'll end there, I think.